Hello, welcome back to another Pen Talk. Thank you for tuning in and following me as I explore the wide world of pens. And it is amazingly wide world of pens. Some of you may have watched my Pens in a Box video in which I talked about the early days of fountain pen collecting where you could find a lot of pens out in the wild and they were at reasonable prices. When I went through that box I said I will start restoring some of these and these are the two that I wanted to start restoring. One is a Morrison's, the other is a J. Harris. They have this gold overlay with different patterns. The J. Harris is like a gothic pattern it's been referred to and the Morrison's has like a wave pattern. These are in the as-received condition. I have not polished them, not done anything to them. The material is, is uh, gold-filled and they're designated and we'll look at that in more detail as we explore these pens. But obviously I just can't talk about these pens without talking about some of the history behind them. So let's talk about Morrison first because they're a little bit more well-known and you can find both of these pens. Morrison's more readily available than the J. Harris, but they're available on eBay and they're at very reasonable prices because they're not popular. They're not a Waterman, Parker Schaefer, Wall Eversharp, or some of the other more popular brand names, but they are very good writing instruments. They survived, obviously, the test of time. These are probably close to 100 years old made in the late 20s up to probably the mid 30s so let's start exploring Krebs wink at you so over my collecting days I was able to collect a little bit of Morrison pens but all of these have some downsides to them uh, the leather pouch was very popular genuine pig skin you know you could put that in your through your belt and this is a classic design both of these are fairly well engraved I would say they're close to mint but as we unscrew the cap there is no nib this unscrews to reveal an interesting piston filler. I've not done anything to restore these. I would probably look for a nib first, but sometimes you just want to keep things in the as-found condition. Here's a box, which you can still find on eBay. Here's an auction. Inside the box is another set, pen and pencil set, and another genuine Morocco belt holder. A little bit different design, that classic clip that Morrison is famous for. The clips are engraved and we'll see a common theme here as we unscrew the cap. There's no nib. This as you can see from the lever filler is a sack filler and it still has the original sack which is still usable. So that's interesting. One of the things in my explorations is I find that Morrison's very seldom came with a their own nib. A lot of times they had warranted nibs, and I have a number of warranted nibs, so I may be able to find some to fit those pens if I wanted to bring them back into writing order. So this is my most interesting set in a nice box, probably from the early 20s. I'm not going to unfold the paper in there, but... Interesting design, small pen, classic Morrison, top of the cap. Again, this is the as-found condition, you know, the engraving on the lever. And this has a nib on it. And if we look at it, it's a warranted nib. So not labeled Morrison. So that's my Morrison collection. 
I've been collecting these for a while and like I said I went to a lot of flea markets, antique shops or whatever and I picked these up for a few dollars and now they sit in my collection and I have to decide what I want to do with them. So one thing that was nice about this pen is the model is engraved or hot stamped into the barrel. It's a cameo top and as we can see it's labeled with Morrison as they've done on all the other pens that I have. So since we're talking about two vintage pens, I think we need to do a little bit of a history lesson. So there are two things that I do when I'm trying to find information about vintage pens. Number one, I check Richard Binder's site and I'm going to give links to both Morrison and Jay Harris and you can read what Richard has to say about these pen makers. And the other thing I do is I check out eBay. And one of the things that was apparent right away is there's very few J. Harris pens relative to Morrison's pens. So that's something to talk about how many of these pens might be out there in the wild. The other thing that I uh, noticed is, is that there's a great variety in these pens. And they're not that expensive for the gold-filled pens. You know, the ones that I'm restoring now are probably being sold in the $50 to $100 range, sometimes over $100, but you'll find on eBay, sometimes people will uh, put a pen up for auction and they'll put a really ridiculous price on it. Or sometimes pens just get bid up from some bidding war for some reason, which usually mystifies most people that aren't involved in the bidding. But that's how we look at these vintage pens. And Morrison's had a long run from about 1910 to 1960. I don't think I've never seen any of the later pens available or references to them. There's less information on J. Harris. So apparently it was a company formed by Jacob Harris and Emmanuel Harris. And they operated under J. Harris and Company. They also made the majestic pens that we see a lot in the tier three vintage. And they were generally low cost, and that was their place in the vintage pen arena. Um, but you know, from these two pens, just looking at these two pens, I feel the J. Harris is a little bit more well made, it has a little bit uh, thicker gold filled materials, it feels more substantial, and it's slightly larger than the Morrison pen. And that, to me, makes it a better pen. And also, it has the Parker nip. So let's return back to my review. So we're going to talk about gold-filled and rolled gold. So this uh, wide cap band is engraved 140th 14 karat RGP rolled gold plate, which is similar to gold-filled. It might be exactly the same, but it's just given different designations. And gold filled is more regulated and by the Federal Trade Commission as a certain type of designation. So somebody knows what they're getting as far as gold content goes. So that's 1 40th of the weight of the metal in this band is 14 karat gold. So obviously the pen to compare these two is a Waterman in the 52 series. Could be four five twos, five five twos, depending upon what metal was used in the overlay. The 400 series is sterling silver. The 500 series is some form of gold filled, gold uh, colored. And the 52 is certainly larger than either the J. Harris or the Morrison pen. The Morrison pen is slightly smaller than the J. Harris. But I think you can see back in the day when these were popular pens that the metal overlays were popular and one of the things that Waterman did was they certainly let you know by engraving in the material what it was you know obviously the top is sterling has a nice um, weave pattern down below as we go around there's some initials in there, NLB. I thought I saw gold filled on this at one time, but I don't see it anymore. So I probably got it confused with some other pens. But it is gold filled. It's not plated or anything else, and it's certainly not solid, because that would definitely 
have a 14 karat solid hallmark on it. So you may ask, why did I pick these two pens? Well, obviously they're nice looking pens. They're in very good shape. All those threads on the cap are there. It takes about one and three quarter turns to get off the cap. And the other thing that makes these workable is the section comes out easily. The lever's in good shape. Everything is, is just ready to be restored on these pens. Basically all they need is a sack. I will do a little bit of cleaning. The threads on the J. Harris are not quite as clean as on the Morrisons, but it works fine. I may just clean up those threads. There may be some gunk in there. You know, there's a overlays are over ebonite hard rubber, which was a very common material. And this also comes out. And the other thing that makes the J. Harris pen interesting is it has a Parker dual fold nib. It's a nice nib. I like that tipping material. And the Morrison pen has a Morrison nib. So that's the first one we've seen. That makes this pen actually, to me, worth whatever the few dollars is I paid. And those tines just come right back. It's not a big issue. These are soft nibs. You know, I'm going to pop this out and realign it because I don't like that distance between the end of the nib and the feed. The one on the Morrison is done better and that looks like a Parker feed, but I'll find out more when I pop it apart. Such is the life of exploring and restoring vintage pens. And these are like tier three pens. Again, they're not top of the line, Parker, Schaefer, Waterman's, whatever, but they're still great pens and they're worth bringing back into full operational order. So you may say, Chris, why don't you show us all the details of your restoration? Well, that's not the purpose of this video, number one. And number two, I've already done a lot of restoration videos where I've shown all the different bits and pieces and techniques that I use and tools that I use. I'll put a link to the most popular in the first one that I did. It's a long video, but it includes everything and would be relevant to the restoration of these pens. So if you're interested in more detail, please check out that video. So a lot of people like to shellac these sacks onto the end of the section. I don't. This is a good example of one where the shellac has completely hardened the sack and it's going to take a lot of scraping with a scalpel that I use to get off that old sack so I can put a new one on. That's why I don't shellac them. I use a water-based, waterproof outdoor glue that I just put a little smear around here, let it pretty much almost dry, slip on the new sack, let that dry, and then I put shellac on the very outside of the sack, which will maintain structural stability, seal up against the section, but not turn and petrify the sack. So here's my trusty scalpel. Yeah, a few dollars invested and I got a whole bunch of replacement blades so when this one wears out I can put another new fresh blade in it that's nice and sharp. I just scraped and scraped and scraped. Here's all the crap I got off. As you can see it's just so brittle it just comes off in little pieces and then I go around this with sandpaper, scrape a little bit more. It's just a, a multi-stage process to eventually get that clean enough that I'm comfortable putting a sack on it. Then I'm going to flush this, see what the flow is like. If the flow is good, this is not going to be taken apart any further. I'll put a sack on it and put some ink in it. So I use my bulb syringe to flush all my pens. And this is the Parker nib. It was in the J. Harris pen. Unbelievably good flow. And as you can see, a fair amount of ink's coming out of here. So I'm just going to leave that set. Uh, it may take a couple hours before it comes out pretty clean. But I'll be comfortable then not having to take that section nib and feed apart any more than it is now. That's good flow. Probably just a little bit of residual ink left in there from decades of not being used. So I popped out the Morrison nib using my knockout block, cleaned it up. That tipping material could be problematic. 
Originally, I thought maybe some of the iridium was lost, but I think it's been ground by somebody. So we'll see how it writes. It may require a decent amount of smoothing. And while I'm at it, I soaked the section, soaked the feed. There was a little bit of residual ink left in both. I ran my rolled up paper towel in inside of the section. As you can see, a fair amount of black ink came out, and I'll keep doing this until they're clean. Like we have clean water now running out of the J. Harris nib and feed. So since I'm further ahead on the J. Harris pen, I decided to clean up this gold filled. It really cleans up extremely well. Here's the polishing pads I use. I don't use a paste because paste has to be cleaned off. It leaves residue. This pad just cleans off oxidation, grime, and grit and gives me a nice surface which I'm going to wax. I know there's a lot of controversy about using Renaissance wax, but I've used it for 20 some years and have never had any issues, especially on a metal like this. You want to minimize the tarnishing and you got to remember it's a 12, 14, 18 karat gold still has some other metals in it, which could be copper. Who knows what they could have put in it, silver. And that those metals tarnish and like gold, and you're not going to use 24 karat gold because it's too soft. But I'm just impressed how well this has turned out. And if we compare it to the Morrison one, you'll see that the Morrison one is a little bit of a tarnish color. It's a darker color gold, where this is more of a yellow gold. You might call this rose gold, but that's not what it was designed to do. So we're going to polish that one up too and see what it looks like. So now I've polished and waxed the Morrison pen too. It certainly has quite a shine to it and it did clean up very, very well. The rose gold color is still more dominant than it is on the J. Harris pen. And we'll see very clearly the 140th 14 karat doesn't say GF or anything other than that. So that's kind of a partial identification, whereas on the J. Harris, it's 14 karat gold filled, but no designation as to how much of that is gold. So both of these have um, not an official designation as required by FTC, but it's not regulated that much. Both pens have an area to engrave initials. You notice I wear a cotton glove when I do any polishing or waxing. Number one, I don't want fingerprints or hand oils to get on here while I'm doing that process until the pens are waxed. And then they're pretty much going to be easy to clean up afterwards. But hopefully you can appreciate those intricate designs carved into there. There's a little dent there at the top of the Morrison. Deducts a few points from those that are into collecting pens, but to me... It's just something that indicates it's a vintage pen. We're ready to put a sack into the J. Harris pen. So one of the other reasons why I like these is no sack in there. As you can see the lever springs back because there's a J bar in there like this. So when it's in there, that spring action of this bent piece keeps the pressure bar up against the lever and then when you push the lever down it comes down the one in here is one piece it doesn't have this other piece these are modern ones ordered a bunch of them different lengths because you never know when you need one this is a number 17 sack it goes in and out very easily and as you can see I don't need to cut much off of it and in another day we'll be ready to write so I finally got the Morrison nib feed and section cleaned out. It took a lot of soaking using a brush inside here, cleaning out the channel in this interesting design feed. That is a huge channel. It goes all the way to the end almost. Fins, which really don't do much, you know, comb, however you want to call them. This is a small nib and it's also a thin nib. And that's one of the differences, I think, between this type of 
pen tier three from the tier ones which had larger nibs and thicker nibs more substantial nibs but we're gonna attempt to put this back into the section and there's where I want the feed relative to the nib so these generally aren't keyed but what I do is I turn it until I think it slides in well and there I think it's good I'm happy much nicer than it was originally and we'll fix those tines like I said that's a different type nib it's uh, going to be problematic but I'm not going to really do much more with it until I ink it up and see how it writes because it's probably going to require some tuning it's now the next day and these are ready for inserting into the pen so you could see I put a coat of shellac on the end of the sack at the seam between the section and the sack. One thing to point out is the Morrison I could only put a number 15 sack in, but a number 17 fit into the J. Harris, and here you can see the difference in the diameter. It, it is significant. They're both about the same length. The other thing to point out is how thin the Morrison nib is compared to that Parker nib that's in the J. Harris. And that was one of the trademarks of a lower end tier three American pen maker back in the 20s and 30s and 40s is they just use less of the expensive materials. Henceforth, they were able to come in at a lower price point. But yet, you have to remember, wasn't the same quality. I've darkened the room. We can get a little bit of a better appreciation of this engraving that was done on these two different pens. And there's a lot of similarities on the clip design. Maybe the same subcontractor or parts supplier made that clip for both of these pens. One of the things I also like to do is bring in the LED and look inside these two caps. We'll see a nice machined ledge in the top of that J. Harris cap and I think that would seal up this nib very very well. We look to the Morrison and we'll see a similar ledge but because the Morrison is such a smaller diameter the ledge is not going to be as pronounced or as thick as the ledge in the J. Harris. Also, the J. Harris, you can see, is more substantial. There's more hard rubber ebonite. It's just, a, I think, a heavier duty, well, more well-made pen than the Morrison. So I might talk about the size of vintage pens, and they're generally on the smaller side. Here's a Pilot Metropolitan and a Pelican M800. Figure we go from a smaller modern pen to a larger modern pen. And both of these are shorter than any of these pens and the girth on the J. Harris is a bigger than the Metropolitan and I think both of these pens have a very nice section which is easy to hold and write with but they're in a you know I'd say medium size range so both of the vintage pens post securely but not deeply so they make for a very long pen posted you can see the section on the Morrison's is definitely on the small side, but there's a lot of design traits in common between these two pens, especially the way the section is designed, the way the threads are positioned, and then the hard rubber section between the end of the section and the gold filled barrel. You can see a more standard design here, but this nib on the Morrison is very very tiny and the one on the J. Harris I would say is is smaller than a number five and obviously the large one on the M800 and here we are with a close-up for your viewing entertainment so obviously if a Pilot Metropolitan section was okay with you the Morrison would work fine also and the J. Harris would be just a little bit nicer uh, somebody remarked that the M800 had a small section. It's small in length, but certainly not in girth, and it feels fine in the hand. So after exploring these pens in 
detail and close up. I'm very surprised with the similarities that these two pens have in common considering they're two different manufacturers, which leads me to my theory about the fountain pen heydays in the 20s, 30s, and a little bit into the 40s, where there were literally hundreds of pen makers around the country, a lot of them centralized in New York City, but also in other towns across the country. And I think that, you know, with any industry, you're going to get a supply chain. Sometimes it breaks. But you're going to get manufacturing companies that maybe focus on the clip. Or obviously might machine ebonite. And they probably then would produce those parts and send them to a final assembly plant, which would probably represent the eventual maker of the pen. So that's what I think these represent. It's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. So we're just going to dip these pens to write a la Graham Mia. You know, Steph does that a lot. I don't really want to put these sacks full of ink. Who knows where these pens might end up. So let's take a look at those nibs writing. So this is the ink I'm going to dip the nibs into. It's an ink I haven't used in a very long time. And I wanted a nice safe ink, and I think Aurora is known for their good quality, consistent, safe inks. So you heard that this is a very smooth nib. It's a pleasure to write with. Very consistent line. The nib is just a little bit soft. I wouldn't call it any of a flex nib, but you can see you get some line variation with a little bit of pressure. So I'm happy with the way this writes. Let's move on to the Morrison. This is a very soft nib. It is sharp, which is what I expected from looking at it, but it writes nicer than I expected. And it is sensitive to angle. That angle, I think, works the best. You know, this is really a classic vintage nib. Very few of them that I have were ground like this. Who knows who ground it? But it works well. And you can hear it on the paper, and it's a sharp italic, which is going to have that characteristic, but I like the way the line it lays down. Hopefully you've enjoyed this exploration of vintage pens. Thank all of you for watching. This video finds you safe, healthy, and happy, enjoying your pens, exploring the incredible wide world of pens, this gold just really feels, nothing feels like gold in your hand. I don't consider it a feel that I particularly enjoy. I like to feel a hard rubber and, and acrylic and everything else a little bit better, but I can understand the attraction of a pen like this. Visually attraction. So if we've reached the end of this video. Yeah, it is a nice nib. If you push it, it's going to run dry, so you need to take your time with it, which is a lot of calligraphers do. But meanwhile, for this video, we're going to say bye. Ah, nice nib.